Welcome to this episode of Stacks and Stories, the podcast of the Mississippi Library Commission. On this episode, join Amy, JD, Kayla, and Christina as they chat with Tracy about all things paranormal. Listen as they talk about what is paranormal, some of their favorite books, and if they've ever had a paranormal experience. Hey, welcome to this episode of Stacks and Stories. Today, we're going to talk about spooky stuff. We're going to talk about the paranormal and books that are a paranormal crew. I just made that up. Actually, as we were planning this episode, we called it the Spooky Club, but I don't think anyone liked that actually. So we may have to just redo this opening, but maybe we'll just let it go. (laughs) Anyway, hey, I'm here with some folks who are into paranormal books, and they're going to give you some recommendations and just have a discussion about all things spooky. I'm here with Amy. Hello. JD. Hello. Kayla. Hi. And Christina. Hey. And so they're going to give us some recommendations, but first let's talk about what what actually is paranormal. It, y'all just jump in if someone has a what you think of as paranormal. It does not have to be a dictionary definition because I have a dictionary. I just want to know <laughs> <laughs> what what you what you think of. I think Kayla could give us the best definition. I would throw her <laughs> under the bus. I, I, whenever I think of paranormal, I think of, you know, just like creatures specifically, I think, is kind of what I think of, you know, werewolves, creatures, ghosts, okay. monsters of all shapes and sizes and uh, all of that. Like but, there's, you know, the the occult kind of stuff and then there's like all of the, you know, the hammer horror spooky monsters and like that's where paranormal is to me. In the horror part? Yeah. Or in like, the spooky part? <laughs> in the, no, I mean, like, instead of, you know, like, uh, you know, demons and, and cults and all of that kind of stuff, like, then there's, you know, like, uh, your, your werewolves and vampires and swamp things and whatever. And, like, that's kind of what I think of. That's just okay. me, though. I was going to ask if you considered a ghost and something like a vampire or a werewolf in the same category, because you said you know, the occult and demons and things like that. And then on the other side was vampires and werewolves and ghosts. Right. Oh so like, par- to me, paranormal and supernatural are like two, uh, like on either side of the Venn diagram that is almost but not quite a circle. And ghosts can kind of meander through both of those, which works because they're incorporeal. So <laughs> they're <laughs> translucent, right? They can go into any Venn diagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's, right. you know, go, ghosts are just whatever. Ghosts are the best, actually. Ghost stories are my favorite thing, so. Ghosts are the best. Yeah. You and heard it here. That's the, the sound bite clouds. for this episode. <laughs> yeah. Ghosts are what I immediately thought of when you said paranormal. And um, so I that's what I immediately went to. But I also, being the total nerd, started researching it, you know, online to find out the difference, you know, because to me, they almost uh, supernatural and paranormal kind of cross paths, like you say, in the middle of the night in the graveyard. Yes. <laughs> so it's it's not horror. It's just kind of weird stuff. Is that kind of like ghosts and aliens? Do aliens count as I, paranormal? I would never count that. <laughs> well, what I think of is I keep it pretty wide open, apparently, like probably the most broad out of everyone here. I think about like supernatural, if science is the study of like the natural world, we have rules that we can apply and we understand the world through those. So supernatural is anything that doesn't seem to obey those rules or like we just can't understand it. So like gravity, right? If I drop a pencil, it hits the floor. We understand that. If I drop it and it suspends in midair, now we're in supernatural territory because it's like not obeying some kind of rule that like we understand Whoops. could that could that also not be science fiction yeah because that's so, where aliens and things yeah, yeah. Like, like aliens can be scary yeah. but they are not supernatural uh, well see i don't I, well, I just think about it it's just being like something beyond natural i guess i might be too caught up in just the word though so no and i mean when you look up definitions of paranormal and supernatural they're basically almost the same definition just worded slightly differently but like you know horror and fantasy and sci-fi and just speculative fiction in general all do that funky overlap and that's why you know you have people that argue until they're blue in the face over if such and such movie is a horror or if it's sci-fi or a horror and fantasy or a horror and thriller because I love to see what people differentiate between those two (laughs) so like yeah it's it's funky and weird 
Okay. What about like cryptids? Where do, are those paranormal or are those just yes. weird? Okay. Those are. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, but aliens aren't. Right, because aliens have a set of rules. We just don't know them. Well, I'm sure. Well, I mean, I'm, that I'm sure has a rule too. that you just don't know about. Well, an you alien, might have a whole book of rules. An alien can be a horror story. It can be scary, but it is not supernatural. So, would you consider ET and alien the same? Well. I actually, when I was um, making some notes, I was like, okay, so paranormal is more like E.T. versus Freddy Krueger. And then I thought, what an awesome head-to-head match. <laughs> um, but yeah, those they're both like from somewhere else, right? They're like creatures from another place. Yeah, but... Just because one is allegedly cute, I, I don't see it. I never I have seen it. I think the only real differentiation there is the plot of the story they're involved right, in. Because right. aliens, I think by definition, could be... You know, it, it, it really... I think it depends on, on the alien. And, and my, my counter to they're not, you know, paranormal, they're sci-fi or whatever, is the X-Files, like, in its entirety. Because... Those two, paranormal and, and alien, sci-fi, whatever, overlap completely in that. And they got 10 seasons out of that. I believe. <laughs> sure. No, yeah. I... So I think it's safe to say that paranormal can encompass pretty much whatever we think it... I mean, there there's not like... Paranormal, I think we called this episode, and when we were planning for it, we didn't just call it... We wanted to differentiate it. This is not horror necessarily. It can be scary, but it anything like weird and spooky um, is in this category. So I'm sure some of you will have things that skew in various directions. So I would like to who I'm going to call on JD because he's drinking. uh, He's taking a sip of his water, and that is funny. So JD, what's your first recommendation for if someone is like, oh, got to got to read some paranormal. I want to get into it after this debate that we're having. <laughs> okay. Well, seeing as how I'm woefully underprepared to give recommendations, I will say that the last book that I read that kind of fits into this category would be American Gods by Neil Gaiman, which I enjoyed quite a bit. I really enjoyed Neil Gaiman's work. And I think this would also be a good, this would also be a book that would challenge the definition of supernatural or cryptid or whatever, because it's dealing with um, these manifestations of gods and the bad things that they do and the good things that they do. And sometimes they appear as kind of human and then sometimes they are more their traditional god form giant spider or an eight-legged fox or something like that so that that would be my recommendation okay have you have the rest of the spooky club have y'all read this Mm -hmm. watch the tv show ah we love things that we can also watch or watch instead. It's a gateway. I usually work backwards, so watch the TV show or movie. Going to have to read the books. And that yeah, that that has a payoff sometimes. Usually it's sometimes it's better, but then sometimes it's not. And uh, we have different episodes where you can read all uh, listen to all some folks debate books versus movies and which one's better. I keep interrupting you, JD. No, I was just going to say I have not seen the TV show. But I did get on the Star Zap and read the synopsis of each episode <laughs> as I was almost done with the book. And I was like, this seems very different from what I'm <laughs> reading right now. So the TV show looks good. And I did, I couldn't help but see Wednesday as the actor who plays Wednesday in the TV show. As I was reading, I, I, that's just who I imagined. So... So I have to ask, since I only I have only seen the TV show, is there a War of the Gods, the New Gods and Old Gods in the books? There is, uh, kind of. I don't want to give anything away because that is kind of the major, you know, plot point is 
Mr. Wednesday, who is Odin, has this sidekick named Shadow, and Shadow is the main character. And Mr. Wednesday is trying to recruit all of the old gods that are in America from different cultures, Eastern European, Egyptian, African, and even some gods that are kind of just manifestations of our idea of what a god is to fight for their place in the new world against things like lust and greed and technology that we have made into gods in their own right. I enjoyed the visual representation of technology or media in this series. Is he a, he's, he's like a little chubby, mean kid. Yeah, no. No? No, that's not how it did. But it, but it would change, you know, with the season okay. or the, through that, you know, yeah. representing how different people would see the media, new media versus old media. That was, you know, for me being marketing, social media, all of that, that was really neat to see how that changed. Media is a is portrayed as a really beautiful woman. And then media television is its own god and television is whatever character is on the TV whether it's you know Lucille Ball, Lucille Ball yeah. yeah or the entire cast of Cheers <laughs> yeah and then technology the internet smartphones they are portrayed as like this mean little kid cuz i guess they're so new right and they ride around in the back of a limo and just do bad stuff it's it's interesting okay Kayla what is tell us tell us a book that that you recommend in this genre? Okay, so mine is going to be like slightly to the left cuz first of all it's an anthology. Like that's one thing I tried to do was was talk about some anthologies cuz I love anthologies. But this one I wanted to talk about it's Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. Have any of y'all read this? No. I actually have read part of it. Oh. And I don't this is not even, you know, my jam. And I, and I've read that. It's so good. Um, Carmen Maria Machado has this way of writing that's, it's really visceral, but it's still kind of fantastical. Like if you've seen Pan's Labyrinth or anything like that, like it's, I wouldn't say it's quite so far into that fantasy realm, but it's got that same kind of vibe where you're not sure how much of it is real and how much of it is just metaphor if that makes sense but her body and other parties is kind of it's described as sort of like psychological realism versus science fiction and and fantasy and like it's got several stories but two of my favorites in the whole thing is the husband stitch which is the first one and it's kind of the most well-known one and it's a a really interesting take on the famous you know green ribbon story which most of y'all do know the green ribbon story you know, the lady has a green ribbon around her neck, her neck, and she says, oh, you can never take it off, and then they get married, and tell us, tell us the end. The, she keeps telling the husband he can't ever take it off, and he, you know, that's like the one thing he's not allowed to have, so then one day he does take it off, and her head falls off. <laughs> Classic. Love it. Classic, yes. <laughs> Pay attention to your wife. <laughs> right? And it's, it's really good. And then there's another one that I love. It's called Especially Heinous. And it's a really weird take on Law & Order Special Victims Unit where, like, it's all, like, in script form. And it starts out, you know, totally normal for, you know, the show. And it's, it's kind of funny and kind of weird. And then it just slowly progresses into get weirder and weirder and weirder. And it definitely kind of becomes sort of X-Files-esque situation happening. And I don't know, it's great. I just, I really enjoy her writing and I really enjoy like all of the different, you know, a lot of times with an anthology or a collection by one author, they can kind of feel very, very similar. And these don't, like each one of these short stories just comes completely out of left field every time and it's always just super weird and I think like when I reviewed it on Goodreads I was like I don't know what to say right now except for like at least three of these stories are probably going to haunt me until I die <laughs> like so yeah there's that you know uh, most of the time when people say oh that um, that's gonna haunt me it's a bad thing but in this context <laughs> of spooky club that is a, a, a huge endorsement right yeah. So Amy, what about you? 
right, so I have brought with me today a book called House of Leaves by Mark Z. Daniel Lewski. <laughs> and I absolutely love this book. I will say, I'm kind of building on what you literally just said about this being a mark of a good book if it haunts you. This is one of the only books, like, I ever remember making me, like, look over my shoulder and, like, <laughs> make sure someone's not in the room with me or, you know, that the metafictional parts of it aren't actually, like, happening to me. But, yeah, basically there's, like, two things, I guess, to kind of, like, know about this book. One is that it is kind of that found footage thing I think it's been described as like if Blair, the Blair Witch Project were a book because this guy like finds this um, documentary right and the documentary is about this person trying to understand this house that he's bought because it's bigger on the inside than the outside but then there's also like footnotes and this dude who found the documentary is like telling his own story on the side so it's like this really cool thing where it feels like it might be happening yeah I thought it was like really creepy and also the format's kind of like the thing about this book because it's so divisive it's like other people love it the, all the footnotes and the colored pictures and all these really different things or they like hate it but no one really seems to critique the story just the format and I think that's like really interesting what's it called again a uh, house of leaves I I like a funny format a funny format can win me over no matter if it's well, actually, I get scared really easily, so I, I probably won't. If it scares you and this is the kind of thing you like reading, there's no hope for me. I'll never sleep again. But I am really intrigued. So is it is it just that you are – how how does a documentary – is he, does he describe it or do you, do you, like, how, how does that, how is that represented in a book is what I'm asking. Oh, you're like reading what they went through in the film. Okay. Yeah, like, I think from the characters' perspectives and what happened, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it has been a little while since I've read it, but, which, I mean, again, speaks to how strong it is, right? I still remember how it made me feel all those years ago, but yeah. Uh, I'll pause before we get back into this and ask, has, have you ever read anything too spooky for you? Like, you're already spooky fans right you like ghosts and monsters and whatever is there anything you had to you had to put down and say like oh no too much too much for me that you can recall I was a little overwhelmed by reading The Exorcist and the Amityville Horror but I was also a lot younger so kind of hit hard see even when I was younger like I read stuff I probably had no business reading let's be real but I never got too scared there's stuff I've read that like the what happened in it was awful and like made me feel you know a little nauseated by some of you know the the implications or some of the the gore or something like that but I've never been like too scared reading and I'm definitely one of those people that like can't stop myself from looking at the horrible thing like so it would have been really unfortunate if I had run into a book that scared me too much but couldn't stop reading it but no I haven't had that experience hmm JD any anything that's too much for you oddly enough I'm a big scaredy cat when it comes to movies or tv shows that are scary I have never been scared by anything written on a page Hmm, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> it doesn't affect me that way. And that might be because, you know, when I'm envisioning it, I'm maybe putting limits on what I'm experiencing. For me, the only thing that really has ever turned me off was, like, I, I don't really enjoy some of the gore in some things, but I just speed past it and I'm fine. But no, no book... Nothing written on a page has ever scared me in that way or made me want to, like, stop and take a break. If anything, it makes me go, I, I consume it quicker. I want more of it. This is not, I can't read anything scary, but if, but a good book or TV show or movie or whatever has conflict in it. That's what, like, people just like drinking tea and being nice. That's a boring book, right? So... When there is a conflict, I flip ahead a few pages to make sure everyone's alive, and then I go back. And so it's not like spoiling. It's just making sure sometimes when I watch TV, I will mute it to get through the conflict part if I don't just fast forward through it. And then, oh, okay, his head blows off. That's fine. Now that I know, I can go back and watch it. But I, I, I don't know. Just have a, a short 
because um, you can't deal with like that tension and anticipation. Yeah, the tension is yeah. absolutely excruciating. It's it, like the end result. I can deal with it. I can, I can, you know, I can roll with it, but not as it's happening when I don't know what's going to happen. And as for what JVD was saying, I think it's harder to get a jump scare in a book. And a lot of movies and TV shows like rely kind of on jump scares. And for me, those aren't really scary. They're just startling. And then I'm annoyed. So like that, you know, that does bug me. But like, yeah, like I, I think it's it's harder to incorporate that into a book unless it's like a surprise pop up book. I I was, yeah, I wasn't thinking about like a surprise. I was thinking about like more of a mood and atmosphere. Yeah. You know, it's the thing is coming. And oh, my gosh, it's you just couldn't take it. Christina, tell us about a book you recommend. So uh, being the overachiever uh, I am, I, I kind of panicked a little bit and was thinking, okay, what do I have on my bookshelves that would fit the paranormal genre? So at first I went to Hoopla, because I recently just became a fan of Hoopla, and looked up paranormal and realized they had over 9,000 ebooks and over 200 audiobooks. And I'm like, well... I'm not sure there. Let me go look again on my shelves. And I found a book from my childhood that I had forgotten I had called 13 Alabama Ghosts and Jeffrey. Classic. It's a classic. (laughs) I love this book because I am more of what people might call spoopy as opposed to spooky. And as the person who wears all black at the agency, (laughs) I'm still very Disney Haunted Mansion level scary. And this book was... published in 1969 by Catherine Wyndham and Margaret Figg, and I think that's how you say her name is F-I-G-H, and I love this book. Just like the title, it's 13 stories from around the state of Alabama, and what got it for me that made me like, I, I you know, I want to be Wyndham, is that there was a picture of her and Jeffrey in the front cover. And tell us about Jeffrey. Jeffrey is the ghost that lives in her house with her. <laughs> And they were goofing around taking pictures of everybody. And there's one picture with her, and he's in the back. This weird shadow in the background is Jeffrey. So, it, and all the weird stuff that happens in her home, they blame it on Jeffrey. And so I was like, I want a ghost in my house. Yeah, maybe, a friendly maybe. one. Fri- a friendly one that, you know, brings me tea or something. You know, I don't know. Um, and so I went and looked up some more information about her. And one thing that uh, Wyndham said in one of her later life interviews is that you don't have to believe in ghosts to enjoy a good ghost story. And I thought that was pretty significant in case people, you know, felt like there were only certain genres they liked. You know, you can get sucked in for just about anything. So here's the ghost story. But the one I wanted to mention is the Huntington Ghost, which is about... Uh, the Red Lady of Huntington, and she lives on the fourth floor of the Pratt Hall, which is a dorm on the Montgomery, Alabama campus, and periodically people will see the red glow of her as she walks the hallways, and the story is is that she was a legacy person, uh, like, you know, had the legacy if your parents went there, but they had moved up north, and so she came back down south to go to school and just never really fit in, and so, but she was known for wearing red dresses, and like had a red coverlet on her bed, and so kind of really stuck out. Kind of saucy. Yes, but because she never could really make friends in the end, she committed suicide. And so they say that her ghost haunts this fourth floor, and people will periodically see that red glow. And I'm like, you know, that's the level I'm at. Like, oh, I want to see like a red light coming out from underneath the door. (laughs) Have have any of y'all had any ghosty experiences? Had any ghostly experience? Mm-hmm. Quite a few. Don't really want to share here, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll talk. I was going to say we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah. And does anyone have any uh, ghosty story they want to share? Any experiences with ghost friends? I mean, you know, I've done all the seance and Ouija board. I have two or three Ouija boards in my house. I have one you know, sitting above my bar and those things. I think this is kind of a testament to uh, what Christina said, is you don't have to believe in ghosts to enjoy a ghost story. I'm uh, kind of a resident skeptic about all things. So these 
they they're just esoteric items that people you know believe i've had people come to my house and say like oh, i don't i don't want to be in your house you have these scary things these like how are you not uncomfortable with ouija boards hanging on the wall and i'm like they just don't they don't mean anything to me besides you know what we assign them in the moment and i think that's another reason why i'm never really scared of so basically you would say, I ain't afraid of no ghost. I ain't afraid of <laughs> no ghost. Unless, of course, we're in a place that's, you know, haunted. Right, right. Too. Yeah. And my wife can't go to those places, even though she loves that. Um, you, she is not going somewhere and bringing a ghost home with her. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not living through that. What about going to a haunted house? Are y'all into that kind of thing? Like a real haunted no, house like, like, or like oh, a it's spooky, Halloween like... and it's creepy stuff at a fake haunted house. Is that fun oh. for you? Uh, no. <laughs> I I would go to like a a real like allegedly real haunted house because I'm I'm kind of skeptical like you. Like I've loved spooky stuff since I was like a little little kid, but like I've I I would love to you know be proven wrong if there's weird real stuff, but like I've never had that and I've never really believed in it and so, but like I would go to like a real haunted house supposedly but like the the spooky Halloween haunted houses they're super cool and I would work in one and like design one but I wouldn't want to go because I don't like jump scares you know like yeah. I mm-hmm. they just they they annoy me <laughs> yeah I decorate so much for Halloween my husband said enough and go and told me to go work in a haunted house <laughs> so I've started volunteering at local haunted houses so that I can do more with that oh yeah I'm, I'm but the, the Halloween decoration champ. Yeah. In my house. The closest I've come to a ghost is I have a friend who sent me a video of in her house where things were moving, had started moving on their own, and she caught it on camera. And it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I know that there's no way that she set this up because we're talking about things moving, rocking back and forth. And, you know, I don't, what do you think about that? I'm like, holy crap (laughs) the spooky but so it it was it was startling to see the video that her house is haunted and she felt like it was her parents because she had inherited the house after her parents died and that's what she felt like it was happening like in a good way I don't mean to brag (laughs) but I have been on television talking about my experience with a ghost. I used to work, uh, I, used, I lived in Birmingham, Alabama, and I worked at the opera, naturally, jump from opera to librarianship, clearly, <laughs> clearly. And the opera was housed in the basement of this 1927 movie palace, the Alabama Theater. It's gorgeous. It has been fully restored. And part of my job as opera lackey was selling tickets over the phone. And people would say, like, are the seats good there? I'm like, oh, totally. Yeah. I don't anyway, I didn't, I didn't, I was just selling them. I hadn't gone to each section of, of the uh, theater. So I went in, you know, basically just to escape my actual job and just sitting in a nice, cool theater by myself. It was kind of fun. And uh, I was in, like, the upper balcony. And the, the seats were really hard to, like, because uh, they were, had not been replaced yet. They were really hard to, to kind of mash down. I had to like crunch it to like sit down. And I was sitting there enjoying the silence and the seat next to me, which was equally hard to push down, it, it went down by itself. So I'm, I, there is footage of me somewhere making this noise on television. <laughs> because that's the sound of the seat. Anyway, and in uh, histories of the Alabama theater, apparently the story has been told. So when I, after the ghost sat na- down next to me, I left and went to the, the guy who runs the theater. His name was Cecil Whitmire. And I was like, I don't know how to tell you this, but your, your theater's haunted. He was like, oh, are you up in the upper balcony? And it's, he was, a, I can't remember the ghost's name, but he was a known, a known spirit. Isn't that exciting? You thought I had nothing to bring to this paranormal discussion, but <laughs> <laughs> I have a ghost. And I've also had a couple of things like, I don't know, just, just, just other, not, not necessarily scary, but just like, oh, that's weird. I don't, I don't remember. I don't see why that would be there or things that have been moved. But I'm also, you know, a little goofy, so maybe I moved it and forgot. 
I mean, I've had conversations with my grandparents in my dreams after they died. Would that count as something paranormal? Like, I don't know. I don't else? know dreams unless they told you to do bad things and then you did them or something. I don't know. No, it's actually, I think that's, I think that is more paranormal, supernatural than aliens. You know? Everyone fight oh. me. Oh. But, uh, no, yeah, I, agree. I think it's actually really acceptable to view visitations in dreams as like the real spirit of the person. I think that's very supernatural or paranormal. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking, I've, I've had a couple of experiences like that. I, a friend died and I, I had a dream that she was sitting on the end of my bed, but when I woke up, I had the feeling that, you know, something was on my feet, like a cat, but there was no cat there. So was she hanging out with me, like creepily watching me sleep? I don't know. It would be funny if she were, like, and then, and then heard me talking about her, like, that was creepy of you. She's like, that wasn't a cat. That was me. <laughs> Hello. Please, come on. Another book. Another book recommendation. Who has another? Amy? Okay. I really loved this book called Dracula, and I hope I'm getting this man's name right. Dacre Stoker and J.D. Barker, they wrote this story, and I really kind of want to start with how this story came to be, because I absolutely love it. I mean, you know, I love Bron Stoker's Dracula, right? But what I didn't realize is that he went around telling publishers, hey, vampires are real. Publish this real account of Dracula. I know it's real, because, like, I wrote it about him, and, you know, like, got us, you know, that was like his publishing, you know, thing, his marketing strategy. And it's like so great that actually Dacre Stoker is like his great grand nephew. And he was like researching that and found out about that, you know. And so then he kind of did the same thing. He's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, Bram Stoker did know some vampires. They are real. And then here's my account of like his origin story and like how Dracula came to be. So that's what Dracula is. And it's like so... Like, I just, I love that. But then also, like, the book itself is so good. It's so creepy, atmospheric, and I think they did a really good job of, like, you know, kind of making it kind of believable, you know, to the point you're kind of like, I could kind of see this maybe being real, you know? But then also capturing, like, the atmospheric and gothic, you know, feel of the classic Dracula. So, anyways, yeah, I really recommend that book if you are, you know, a vampire person, for sure. If you are a vampire, would you recommend it? A <laughs> vampire? Sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> is it is it set in modern times or is it set? No, in, it's set like in like Bram Victorian. Stoker's time because it's like following his childhood and into adulthood. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is it is it actually fiction or is it? No, it's actually fiction. But what Bram Stoker did was a lot of research and he used real details in Dracula. So his descendant here kind of like played with that, and they're like, "Yeah, he did it because it's actually from his life." <laughs> and read about it. This is his life. <laughs> Almost kind of like an Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter yeah. type idea. Yeah, and has yeah. kind of that feel. It's really fun. Yeah. What's the Pride and Prejudice one? And oh, zombies. And zombies. <laughs> Are zombies paranormal? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Oh. For sure. <laughs> to me, they're kind of on the same par with aliens. Like, but some people think aliens are paranormal. I'm saying they could be. I think it <laughs> depends on how they're written. Yeah. It could go several different ways. Yeah. You know. I think with zombies, it also depends on: are they zombies because there was a virus, or are they voodoo zombies, mm. or is it like? Yes, or a vampiric zombie. zombie, you know, like a f- familiar or whatever they call them. Yeah. Or is it um, a metaphor there was, for consumerism? Mm-hmm. <laughs> if there was a zombie apocalypse, would y'all survive? Yes. <laughs> wow, that was a decisive uh, yes from Christina. Christina's the first one I'm to ready. go. <laughs> what about the rest of you? Uh, probably not. My husband's more of like a, like he, he's like prepper light. Like he's not, you know, going to build a bunker and like have 80,000 cans of peaches, but like he does try to be prepared for stuff. And I'm just more like, eh. So, I mean, I, I feel like that's my answer. If I would survive an ap- zombie apocalypse, eh. I could go either way. Yeah. I would, I, I think everyone's initial response is, of course I would survive. <laughs> And you probably wouldn't. <laughs> no. no one probably would. No, um, I don't see myself as surviving. Yeah. Like, I would not necessarily just lay down in the street and let them bite me, but 
after a little bit of effort, I'm just going to say good night. Come, coming back <laughs> around submit. to hey. my, my skepticism that I was referring to earlier, I have read and seen enough zombie, pandemic, post-apocalyptic, nuclear fallout, end of the world, movies, comics, and books. I feel like I would survive simply because when faced with one of the bad decisions that I've seen other people make in any of those genres and die, I'd be like, oh no, we're not, no, 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 we're not doing that. I read about this. Yeah, no, no, no. (laughs) I'm not falling for it. Yeah, we're not, we're not going north, but we're not going south. We're not staying here, but we're not going to the mall either. (laughs) And we're not going to the Winchester. Yeah. We are going to the Winchester. (laughs) We are going to have a cup of tea. (laughs) What what is that? For Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead. Oh, okay. You know what? I have seen that. Yeah. I've forgotten all of everything i do think mlc has an excellent zombie apocalypse building oh this uh, building? have Absolutely. thought about that yeah a lot <laughs> this is the safest place to be if there's some kind of disaster and if you think i won't be up here in the event that there is some kind of let's just apocalypse. say let's just say during the pandemic there was more than a few times i caught myself daydreaming like yeah and like the other gangs out in the wasteland they would be you know they would <laughs> They would know not to mess with the librarians. <laughs> Don't get too close to that librarian building. Those guys are tough. I was going to say, I feel like the past two years have shown us that, like, it's not necessarily a matter of would you survive or not. It's a matter of, like, how long and, like, right. how stupid are the people around you. Because <laughs> I think by now we all know someone who, like, we've realized would not tell the rest of the the group if they got bitten by a zombie because oh, yeah. they think they can just like overcome it <laughs> right like well i got bitten yesterday and i'm immune now or, yeah. or something <laughs> right. uh, yeah some kind of <laughs> pandemic equivalent although i will say i don't think zombies are paranormal i think that's getting into the line of supernatural unnatural but i thought the vi- the venn but, diagram but then was it, almost a I complete overlap. zombies eat the venn you diagram know, oh, okay <laughs> But it then a cryptid is a, a little sci-fi mixed into it. I don't know. Is so a, like, is a cryptid is Bigfoot supernatural? See, I thought it was. Like, be, I, Bigfoot be, uh, cryptids to me are definitely like the paranormal, supernatural, whatever. I think so because that's a rule of nature, right? That has gone awry. Or maybe Presumably. we just don't understand. Right. <laughs> Do y'all know about the Honey Island Swamp Monster? Yeah. Oh, Honey Island. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's the Louisiana version of of uh, Bigfoot. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, there's an anthology I read recently called Creole Conjure that s- some of the stories center around the Honey Island Swamp Monster, and it's pretty great. Oh, so it's like a Louisiana oh. version of King Kong. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Is, it, is King Kong supernatural? He's a really big gorilla, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> well, no, like, well, soup, like, if we take the word literally... There's natural and there's supernatural. It's bigger than natural. It's different than natural. Right. So, yeah, King Kong is supernatural. Is he paranormal? If the mm. Venn diagram that Kayla brought up, <laughs> well, if, that would, if they overlap, then yes. That would put the hollow earth theory in the realm of supernatural and paranormal? I don't know what the hollow earth theory is. <laughs> it's my favorite. It's. Have you read... Here's a recommendation. Have you read Frankenstein Underground? It's a comic. It's kind of set in, it's published by Dark Horse, and it's written by the same writer, Mike Minola, who wrote the Hellboy series and some other things. But its premise, the hollow earth, is this idea that the core of the earth is, is hollow, and there's another world down there. It's... Have you ever seen any movie like Journey to the Center of the Earth? No. No? Absolutely not, no. Okay. It does not sound like anything I want to watch. I'm sorry. So it's basically... There are mouths agape in this room well, looking at me. Anyway, Frankenstein Underground is Frankenstein's monster eventually makes his way into the hollow earth and lives and does whatever he does. After, after the event in Antarctica where he 
you know, meets mm -hmm. Dr. Frankenstein, he continues his journey and he finds his way into the hollow earth and he rides a dinosaur and does a bunch of other cool stuff. There so. are dinosaurs in the hollow earth? There is. The so land? like Journey to the Center of the Earth, the original, some of the original Jules Verne, right? Mm -hmm. Is they find I'm still mad at Jules Verne. I had to read some book in seventh grade. I'm not over it. <laughs> Fair so enough. There was di he, they go to the Journey to the Center of the Earth. They, that's where they, the dinosaurs are. So, but later you find that's kind of been expanded, like Pacific Rim in the movie is, is a hollow earth where the, what are they called? The kaiju come out from the, this other world in the center. And then King Kong, the recent King Kong versus Godzilla, all that stuff is all hollow earth world building so stuff. So they, they come from there? That's where they the, come from? The idea is that the hollow earth rules that we know are still in place, but they function differently. So that's why you get gigantic monkeys and okay. the dinosaurs are still alive and spiders that are the size of Volkswagens. Mm, I don't like that. Yeah. I mean, so. to be fair, that was a thing in prehistoric times, wasn't it? Because there was more oxygen on the planet. That's why everything I, was so massive. I, I think that's like the scientific the, the okay. theory. <laughs> the loose science. Right. About the hollow earth. If you didn't hear, those were air quotes that, uh, Sorry. <laughs> that Sorry. JD was uh, designating there. All right. W and any other books that uh, Kayla? Um, okay. I, everybody's going to go, oh, God, but I promise I'm not going to talk about all four of these. I just wanted to show. So I've had these exact books like since I was nine. And as y'all can see, like especially this one, they are falling apart. These are Bruce Koval's anthology books there there it's like bruce Koval's book of and then he's got a bajillion of them and it's it's him and several other authors you know create these anthologies based on you know like bruce Koval's book of ghosts book of monsters book of nightmares and this original box set it was monsters ghosts nightmares and aliens and when i was a kid i didn't really care about aliens much so i took that one out and got bruce Koval's book of nightmares too um and i've i've i read these like once a year they're still some of my favorite books they are great like spooky weird anthologies for kids that also like are really good even like as an adult because there are some stories in these that like I know I used the word haunting before but like l legit there there's a there's one story in here it's called For Love of Him by Vivian Van Veld I think that's how you say her name it's the greatest pen name I've ever heard but like that story has stuck with me for you know 20 some odd years now and like i tell everyone about it all the time um, i found a pdf of it online and like forced five of my friends to read it but then there are some that are really funny like there's there's one it's one of bruce Koval's stories in the book of monsters called duffy's jacket and it's about a kid who uh, uh his parents are divorced so he lives with his mom and his little sister and his cousin duffy and duffy clearly has adhd and just leaves things everywhere and and this main kid is like kind of supposed to be his keeper or whatever so his mom and his aunt you know are supposed to like do man stuff with them because they think it's going to like keep them well-rounded so they take them out to this cabin or something that like her boss's friend of a friend lets them use and they all go for a walk in the woods and it's supposed to be great and then they see this this thing like painted on a, a tree or something something about beware the sentinel and they're like okay and then they get back to the cabin and it's written on the wall and they think like the main kid is doing it to scare his little sister and he's like i'm scared i'm not doing it to scare her and then the mom and the aunt you know go out for dinner that night and leave the kids alone at the cabin and then you know then things start to happen but the ending is just like chef kiss like this beautiful hilarious kind of funny it's it's so it's so comedic but done in such a great way that like it still makes me laugh even now at 32 and there are a lot of stories like that in there and then there are some that you know are really spooky and weird even to me as a 32 year old so yeah i highly recommend these they're great well y'all this has been a really fun discussion did we did we talk about books the whole time no but i think that's okay i think this has been a really well-rounded we we had some debates we've uh heard about some books we will never agree what paranormal is and i think that's okay so I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Stacks and Stories. If you've got ghost stories, you should email them to us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Contact us with your favorite uh, spooky thing so we can, I can pass it along to the Spooky Club. Anyway, thanks for listening.
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stacks and Stories, the podcast of the Mississippi Library Commission. We hope you will tune in next time, and we encourage you to visit your local public library often.